Life is based on God's happenings. And God's happenings are eternal. So we always have that source of joy in our life. Second week two we talked about it's all in the mind. To live this life of faith, believing that if I am obedient to Christ, I will put myself in the place where I can receive from Him. This week, we're going to talk about getting to know you, and that is in Philippians chapter 3, our joy is based on relationships. This is what Paul says in three, chapter 3, verse 1 of Philippians. He says, Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again. And it is a safeguard for you. So Paul is writing to the Philippians. He's telling them to rejoice in this relationship they have with the Lord, with Jesus Christ. And he also says to him, it's no trouble for me to write the same things to you. In other words, I'm going to write to you perhaps what I've written before, certainly what I've said to you before. Paul started the church at Philippi and probably visited there at least twice before he wrote this letter. So he had contact with them. He says, I'm going to say the same things to you. But it's not wearisome for me to say the same things because I don't want your, your joy in a relationship to be compromised. These are things that will steal your joy. Safeguards to keep your joy. And number one is to resist legalism. And here's a simple definition for legalism. Substituting rules for relationship. Legalism is substituting rules for relationship. This is what Paul says in chapter 3, verse 2. He says, watch out for those dogs. Those men who do evil. Those mutilators of the flesh. Now, that's pretty strong language, huh? Watch out for the dogs. So we have the Apostle Paul, this great saint. No doubt everyone loved the Apostle Paul. Here's a picture of him right here. There's Paul. They were in awe of him, right? I mean, his head was glowing. I mean, if someone's head is glowing, then I would have awe for that person. I would be in awe. Would you be in awe? Okay. That's called the nimbus, by the way. The halo was, came later. The halo is like the, the ring above the head. You've seen that, right? That's a halo. This is a nimbus. This is actually before the Renaissance uh, halo. See what kind of stuff you learn here at Vineyard Church? I mean, stuff that you can use day to day, right? That is a nimbus. But his head didn't really glow. In actuality, Paul, he had some bitter enemies. We read in Acts twice that there were two plots to kill Paul. One in Acts chapter 9. A plot to kill Paul. In Acts chapter 23, 40 men vowed that they would not eat or drink until the Apostle Paul was dead. I often wonder what happened to those 40 guys. How long they kept that vow. Because they didn't get it. And in that particular plot, the actually the chief priests of the temple were involved in that plot also. So people had, Paul had people that uh, wanted to kill him. Paul was at the very center of the greatest conflict of the early church. Now, what was that conflict? I think in order to understand this verse and to understand why he's calling these people dogs and mutilated the flesh, we have to understand the controversy. Christianity began, began as part of, uh, of, of Judaism. Uh, Christians, they weren't even called Christians. They were either called people of the way or the Nazarenes before they were called Christians. And they were Jewish people who accepted Jesus Christ as the Messiah. That was Christianity. And then there was Paul. Paul was the great persecutor of these Jews who accepted Jesus Christ uh, as their Savior and believed in the death and resurrection of Christ Jesus. But then all of a sudden, Paul has this incredible conversion experience as he's on his road to Damascus. And so he has that. He gets to Damascus, and he begins to prove by the Scriptures that Jesus is the Messiah. That's the first time they tried to kill him. But Paul didn't stop there. Paul went further. He had this call of God to go to the Gentiles, the non-Jews, and to teach them the gospel, to teach them and preach to them that Jesus Christ was the Messiah that through him, there's forgiveness of sins. And so these Gentiles, that's us, began to flock into the church. These unclean, impure, pagan, idolaters, adulterers, drunkards, began to come into the church. And the Jewish Christians, some of them began to say, wait, this is 
happening too fast. We've got to put some restrictions on these people. And so when they come into the church, they have to, be Jew they have to become Jews. They have to be circumcised, because the guys went too high on that. They have to be circumcised, and they have to follow the law of Moses, which was the tradition throughout Jewish religion, Judaism, for centuries. That a Gentile could become a Jew, could become a full Jew. They had to be circumcised, the men, and they had to follow the law of Moses. And so these Jewish Christians, no doubt wanting to put some guidelines on these people coming in, because they were impure, unclean, idol-worshipping pagans that didn't understand how to live, so they had to become Jews. And what Paul says, he says, no. He says, no way. We are justified by faith. And by faith alone. And they said they're going to bring all their idolatry, uh, idolatrous ways into the church. And you know what happened? They did. Read 1 Corinthians. They brought these, these, this pagan baggage with them. But Paul said no. That we are justified by faith. And by faith alone. And we're not going to put restrictions on people coming into the church. Paul believed and the power of the gospel. He believed, and we're going to talk about that later. So the battle line was drawn between the Apostle Paul and some of these Jewish Christians. And we see, certainly, in the book of Galatians, which I'm thinking we need to do a study of the book of Galatians first a year, and also in Acts chapter 15, we see this battle raging on. And as Luke says in Acts chapter 15, in his way of saying, he says there was no little dissension. In other words, there was big dissension. Paul won. The, apostles, the other apostles accepted Paul's gospel and Paul's understanding of, of what should happen. But there were still these opponents of Paul called Judaizers. This is what they would do. Paul would go to a, a city. He would start a church. He would build up the leadership. He would leave. And then these Judaizers would come in after him and say, hey, what Paul was said was good, but we've got the full story right here. You've got to become Jews. And we see Paul dealing with that, especially in the book of Galatians. And Paul calls them dogs. Now, dogs did not have the prestige they have nowadays. You know, you didn't see on a, say, a chariot on, in Rome, you didn't see on the back of the chariot, on the bumper, a bumper sticker that said, I love my peekapoo. You know, they didn't have that culture. Now, if you love your peekapoo, that's fine. But dogs were not highly regarded in the first century, especially among Jews. They were considered to be unclean <coughs> scavengers, and they, people couldn't afford a dog. They could, they could barely afford to feed their kids, much less to feed a dog. And so dogs were highly thought of. And so to call someone a dog was, was not a compliment. And that's what the Jews called the Gentiles. The Jews called the Gentiles dogs. And so Paul turns that around and says, you know, who's the dog here? They're the dogs. They're the ones that are unclean because they're distorting the gospel. And this sacred rite of circumcision which God gave to Abraham so many years ago has now become just a mutilation. They are evil. Don't listen to them. Watch out for those dogs, those men who do evil that will tell you that you have to become a Jew to be a Christian. And then Paul goes on to say in Philippians 3, he says, for it is we who are the circumcision. In other words, we are the, we are the people of God. We are the ones who worship God by the Spirit, who glory in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh. And then Paul says, I should be able to put confidence in the flesh because I was a Jew of Jews, a Pharisee, a Hebrew of Hebrews. I followed the law meticulously, and yet that led me to oppose the plan of God. That it is by faith. It is by faith that we find this righteousness before God. Now, what is faith? What does Paul mean by that faith that justifies? That faith that justifies is that belief that we completely abandon our own righteousness, our ability to be righteous before Christ Jesus. We abandon that and we fully accept the gift that God has given to us. And that is the gift of righteousness through faith in Jesus Christ. Paul said any hint or any minuscule possibility 
that there is something that I can do to be right before God. He said, this is wrong. This is something that Paul was willing to die for. Paul says, no, he says, let them come in. Let the, the pagan idol worshipers come because he believed in the power of the gospel. Okay, what does this mean to us? Has anyone ever met a Judaizer? I never have. They might be out there. So what does this mean for us? Does this mean anything for us? I think it does. I think it has all kinds of meaning for us because this is the core of the gospel. And we see this in such a stark contrast in this first century that Paul is saying to us, there is nothing that we can do. We are completely without the ability to be right before God. And that drives us to the feet of Jesus. And at the feet of Jesus is where we receive forgiveness and hope. So where we, we see the, the experience of God. Our message, and we're, we're going to have a billboard actually coming soon. Look for it soon. It says, it's going to say, come as you are, just like our t-shirt. Who has a t-shirt? There's a t-shirt right here. Come as you are, you'll be loved. Well, I hope we mean that. Because that's what the gospel says. It says to come as you are. You'll be loved. Does that mean as a Christian I can do anything I want to? That what I do doesn't matter? Of course not. But the, the change is in the experience with God. I experience God. I experience relationship. And that changes my life. We'll talk about it a little bit later. So what's examples of legalism? Well, the first one is, is rituals. Now we're going to have communion, the Lord's Supper, here in a few minutes. And uh, I believe it will be a wonderful time of worship. As we have faith in Christ, we celebrate what Christ, Christ has done. We celebrate the relationship that we have with Him. It could be a powerful moment of experience in the Holy Spirit. But somehow I believe that just eating a cracker and drinking juice while someone says words over it, special words, is, in and of itself has meaning, and well, it doesn't. It's all about relationship. It's about rejoicing in that relationship. Also, sometimes there's rules. Now, I've been around the church long enough to see rules come and go. I was seven years old when the Beatles came over. Some of, some of you remember the Beatles coming. 